Is this the most fun Jeep ever developed? Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with Gary Vaslash, episode 277 for March 6, 2015. Small Jeep, Global Footprint. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 p.m. Pacific, and that's 20 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Well, good afternoon, um, which seems odd to be saying because this is Auto Line After Hours, but some of you actually may be seeing it's at the time when it is after hours, but that's a long, confusing thing. But from now on, we're going to be doing the show at 3 p.m. rather than 6 p.m., and uh, the staff enjoys that much more, so that's why we're going to do it. So um, tell your friends, your neighbors, everyone that this is when we're going to do the show. So um, let's introduce our folks here this Afternoon. I keep wanting to say evening. Brett Snavely of the uh, Detroit Free Press. How you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for being here. And uh, you've been here before, so you know the drill. And Joe Sesney of the Oakland Press. Joe, how are you doing? Good. Yeah. Nice to be here. Just, just good. Not. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cold outside. It is very cold outside. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. But it's not snowing, so that's a good thing. That's a good and, thing. Uh, so, and our special guest, Art Anderson, chief engineer of the Jeep Renegade, which is the newest entry into the Jeep showroom. And uh, so we're going to talk about the, the auto sales later on in the show after, after you're no longer sitting in this seat. And okay. I, ju I just think it's worth pointing out that for February over February, Jeep was up 21% and it's up 22% for the year. So Jeep is, is pretty much where it's at, I think, right now. Yeah, it's working well. Absolutely. You haven't even sold one of these guys. You haven't even Not sold yet, these. no. No. So when do they actually go on sale? Well, it's uh, very soon. We actually now have vehicles moving from the port to the dealerships, uh, starting as next week. Okay. So, so you say from the port to the dealership. So this is this is something that's a little different about this this Jeep. It isn't it isn't being built where we might think it's being built. Where is this this vehicle coming from? The vehicle's being uh, assembled in Melfi, Italy. It's in southern Italy, at a, a very very large assembly plant. And um, that's, that's basically where the production mm -hmm. is, where the supply base is. We put the car together, assemble it, and then it goes to the port. Export it, it gets a boat ride, comes in to six different ports here in the, uh, in the U.S. But, but the engineering, you're, you're based here. You're based in Auburn Hills. Yes, sir, absolutely. So the, the configuration of the project, the strategy we used is that the, uh, the product definition, the, the product development, driven out of the Jeep engineering office in Auburn Hills. And uh, we configured it, the package, the design work, all of the styling, all of those things are, are authentic to the, the Jeep brand. Uh, we, we did make the strategic decision to build the vehicle in, in Italy. And the supply base, the part design of the, of the components with the suppliers are all worked out of those, those uh, suppliers in that area. But the thing that makes it the Jeep, the, the ruggedness, the functional things that are core to the, the, the Renegade and its functional behavior were, were uh, defined in Auburn Hills as so, part of Jeep engineering team. So, so I can't imagine anyone who is, is watching or listening <clears throat> to the show um, is not familiar with the, the Renegade, but let's just say someone is. Yeah. How, would, how would you define this vehicle and put it in the context of the other Jeeps that it's a oh. part of the family of. Okay, so it's, uh, I'd say it's the most capable small SUV ever. Um, in, the Jeep, in the Jeep lineup right now, it's uh, about the same length, overall length, as a Wrangler. But um, the vehicle in the lineup is the smallest Jeep at a, at a fairly high volume we're looking at. It is a... Um, an all-new architecture vehicle platform specifically designed for the mission to be the most capable small Jeep ever. And um, to do that, 
you know, we, we configured it specifically for that mission. So the powertrain is matched specifically, the drive line is, is sized to do that <coughs> job. Um, you know, we wanted to have great off-road capability. I mean, there's no one we think that's directly comparable to us for that capability. We have great utility on the inside of the car. We've towed 2,000 pounds. We have a nine-speed automatic transmission, class exclusive, uh, you know, in, in the segment. And in the Jeep family, it's, it's, we're very proud of it as, as the, the smallest entry into that family. It comes with all the credibility and all the functionality that the brand promises and delivers. So, Art, I was, you know, I was out in San Jose for the, for the program and had the opportunity to, to drive the vehicle. It was a lot of fun to drive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was hard to miss one of the key buzzwords out there that you guys were using, no compromises uh, in, in terms of um, capability and fuel economy. Um, can you tell me what, what, is, what does that mean and, and how, did you, how did you strive for that with this product? Uh, oh, okay, good. it's a great question. So, so when you go and do any engineering job or any product design job, you have to make trade-offs and balances in the, in the decisions and the choices. And the place that we've arrived to with the Renegade is that the customer the shopping for that car is not paying a penalty for picking a 4x4, right? We've got the full disconnecting driveline system, so the fuel economy penalty is very minimal. You've got good, comfortable ride. The ride comfort is great, but at the same time, you've got great dynamics and handling. We've got independent suspension all around. We've got a Chapman in the rear. We've got frequency sensitive dampers from Coney on, on the car on all four corners. Take the aftershake, calm everything down, vehicle's very composed. And it's a very smart choice for the consumer. So when we say no compromise, they really didn't give up anything to get themselves into that vehicle. They didn't trade off um, utility because they wanted that style, all right? I mean, if we, if we look at it, we've got, we paid a lot of attention to the inside of the car also. It's a little on the, the, you know, it's not the biggest car in the lineup, but we've paid a lot of attention to the space inside the car. So instead of having a handbrake, you get an electric park brake, that gives you the space back for cup holders between the two seats, right? In the back, we've got a two-level load floor, so the, the, the space in the back of the car can be the lower load floor when you don't have a full-size spare, or it can be in the upper position, so when you fold the seat down, you get the full flat floor. The electric... Um power uh, handbrake that says something else about the vehicle. This has got a very, lot of very sophisticated electronics on it, doesn't it? Like, for example, the, the four-wheel disconnect that you were mentioning, that's all done automatically, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, we've incorporated technology that typically you wouldn't find in, into a, a much, much higher uh, category vehicle. You know, we've got the nine-speed automatic transmission. We've got the electric park brake. We've got a seven-inch color TFT cluster. We've got uh, uh, the six and a half inch nav system in the car. We've got 70% high strength steel, you know, because not only are we the smallest one in the lineup, we're also the lightest SUV in the segment according to the, in, to the EPA fuel economy tables, right? So it's that balance and, and bringing the technology on board because that's what, that's what the customers expect now. You know, we've got, in some of the other options, we've got, you know, you got 110, power supply on board, we've got two USB outlets that are fully connected on a hub, we've got keyless entry, remote start, heated steering wheel, it's a very, very long list. And, and, and importantly, we've got 70 high technology safety systems in the car that are unusual in the segment. We've got uh, lane departure warning, uh, blind spot detection, and forward collision warning plus. So it actually does the, the, the brake apply when you, when you have an impending impact. So all those things are built into the, into, the, into the vehicle and we think we've made it seamless. Customer doesn't really pay a penalty or give up space or be annoyed by the features that are in the car. So, so in other words, this, this is the smallest Jeep, but by no means is this a stripper model that somebody's going to get bare bones technology in. It's got full top level equipment and uh, um, other features. Right. So, so we do start with a sport model. It's a 1.4 liter six-speed manual. You guys had a chance to drive it. The car's 
Very sporty, a lot of fun to drive. That car comes with a standard electric park brake. It comes with a three and a half inch color, uh, black and white TFT display in the cluster. And it's, uh, it's modestly priced. It starts at $17,995. And from that, you can walk up to all of the technology we just talked about. But it's most of the things I mentioned are on, are, are on board and embedded in there and the full capability to add it as you go through the price classes. It's a, a very long list. I'm glad the Internet's out there so at least you can walk through and, and tick off the big long list. What kind of mix do you expect for the different models and the Trailhawk model? Um, I think right now they're, they're looking, so it comes in a, the Sport as a base model, Latitude, Trailhawk, and the Limited. The Latitude, I think, is, is projected to be the, the, the bigger volume percentage. And then um, I think the, the, the Trailhawk is, I think, in the 20% range. Limited's 10%, and probably somewhere around a 60% mix on 4x4. On four four. And I know you're emphasizing the off-road capabilities of the Trailhawk models, but all the Renegades are supposed to be able to go off-road. Uh, wasn't that one of your design bogeys uh, when you put this vehicle together? So, so when we put the vehicle together, we were very, we tried to be really smart about what the mission of the car was, and we set it up so that the people that buy the car for primary on-road use, mm -hmm. let's say the 4x2 version of it, they don't pay a penalty. They don't take a weight penalty. They don't take a structural penalty. So we, that means that we've designed the structure in the vehicle, even the 4x2, to take all the loads that it'll see on off-road. <clears throat> okay. So when we have the off-road version in the Trailhawk, we actually do some significant things, right? So we put the, the all-terrain tires on. We put three millimeter thick skid plates on the bottom of the car to protect the fuel tank and the vitals, if you would, the powertrain, oil pans, things like that. And then we lift it up to uh, 220 mils of ground clearance, get a little more clearance to get over things. And we have a unique fascia that goes on that model, it gives us 34 degree approach angle. And then we love the Jeep, the Jeep authenticity. You're really gonna go off road. You can pull other people out with the tow hooks that we have on the car, two in the front, one in the back. The red tow hooks. The red tow hook, you can't miss it, mm -hmm. yeah. So those are all things that we've done to, to, to actually enable the full off-road capability without penalizing the base car. So those, those bits are added on, but the basic structure is the same. Now inside that, that formula on the drive line, we have a fully disconnecting system on, on all of the, the 4x4s. But on the Trailhawk, we have a, a special calibration we put with it. So we call it active drive is what we have on the, the Latitude 4x4 and the Limited 4x4 and the Sport 4x4. But on the Trailhawk, we have active drive low. And we take use of a special final drive ratio. Gives you a 20 to 1 crawl ratio. So you can select this mode with the terrain, select train switch to figure out which mode you want to be in. You can be in auto, which is great, or snow, mud, sand, and then we have rock. When you go to rock, you know, we drove some very steep terrain with some rocks on it, and in that mode, it gives you an aggressive brake lock differential. So it's aggressive enough that the electronics figure out that if you even have one tire off the ground when you're moving, the tire that does not have grip moves at the same rate as the ground speed. Mm -hmm. All right, so that means you're getting all 2,000 newton meters of torque to the tire that has the best grip. Mm -hmm. So you've got all that off-road capability, and you can probably run circles around your competitors uh, uh, off-road. Um, On-road, you will get about, as my understanding, 30 miles per gallon uh, on the highway for any of the models. Can you talk about, um, can you give us any more detail on where you're at on, on expected fuel economy? So, so I think that you'll find that uh, the 4x2 uh, version is posted. It's, uh, it's out there and available in the EPA database. On that, we've got a, um, a 31 highway. And I believe, I might get it wrong, I don't want to get it wrong, I think it's 23 city combined 25. So that's out there, that's public information. The labeling on the 4x4 is just now, just now uh, going to to press. Uh, on the 1.4 liter, uh, it's a little bit later launch with that powertrain in the car and that labeling process is still ongoing. 
let me, we've got some, you mentioned the internet before, we've got some questions come in from the internet, and, yeah. and so I've got three that I'm going to sort of combine because they're all uh, sort of together. So this is from Matthew Shilto, Wright Knight, and Mike from Philly, and so I'm going to combine these things. Okay. So there is a concern that one expresses about the Renegade because it's a, it's a, it's a fiat platform and they're worried about being a fiat platform. The other question is, why, does, why was this not developed on a full frame platform? And then finally, what came first, the platform or the concept? Okay. So right. you got that? So yep, I'll try. Concerns, um, why not a full frame? And what came first, the concept or the platform? Okay, so, so the, the platform is an all new platform. Purpose built, purposely configured, by Jeep Engineering to say, this is the mission we have to go do. We have to do on-road, off-road, and that's why there's not bolt-on structure, there's not all these other things. We've learned over the years what it takes to actually go do that job, and that's what we brought into this, this whole discussion about, okay, what should this vehicle be, including driveline configurations, you know, all of those important factors. The reason that, that building it in in Italy was an important choice because the Jeep brand is a global brand. In this vehicle, we have 16 different powertrain configurations that we sell globally. We have a right-hand drive and a left-hand drive. The great thing about Fiat Chrysler Automotive is that we're gonna leverage all of that and support the Jeep brand and the things that are there while protecting all the tenants of the brand and the functional things and the things that the customers love and enjoy. So that's that's the story of how and why it is what it is and why it was engineered, primarily driven, here's what it's going to be as a Jeep, and then configured to support all those global markets mm -hmm. as a bigger enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact is, for what we needed to do with the vehicle, we didn't need all of the, the other things that come with a full body frame under the thing. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you give up a lot of weight, you give up potential ride quality, you give up all of the the refinement that the, this particular customer wants. You know, this vehicle basically is, weighs 3,250 pounds curb weight, you know, which is tough to do to get to the smallest, lightest vehicle in the segment. And uh, all those things come back and, and, and wind into the solution set that we brought to the market. Mm -hmm. so, so we actually got a phone call. So somebody actually listened to all those numbers that I gave earlier. So, so Ben, could you bring the call in, please? <laughs> No, maybe he's banned. Yeah, so I got a question about why why are they importing Jeeps into the American market? Why couldn't we, in America, export these Jeeps to Italy and other countries? Um, I know we have problems with our trade agreements. We have tariffs that are, are that work against the American worker. But it just seems like uh, the American brand Jeep should be exported from, from uh, this country. Thank you. We export hundreds of thousands of Jeeps from, from the U.S. right now. You know, nearly everyone, well, I should say all of the Jeeps that we build in the U.S. are exported. Fact is, is that uh, the plants right now are running, running at full capacity, the industrialization and the, and the global markets. You know, we're building the Renegade in Italy. We're also building it in Brazil. So the Jeep brand is expanding into that market. It is going to fit so well in the Brazilian market. I think it's going to exceed all expectations. Uh, you know, as for what it can be, it's going to fit very well there. So, it's a global brand, and we're a global company, and and for sure, it's. Uh, I think we're participating well in the global economy uh, from both from both sides of it. So we'll leave that that whole Italy thing. Just just one more question yeah. we have from um, Tumbinator. Um, <laughs> do do any parts come to the United States? that are shipped there to build this vehicle or are the suppliers all in Italy? Oh no, it's, it, it, seriously, it's really a global project, right? So the engines, the 2.4 liter Tiger Shark, 180 horsepower, built in Dundee, right? So Dundee, Michigan, which is what, about 50 miles from where we're sitting right now? 45. 45? Yeah. Right, yeah. So they go, they go to Italy, they get put in the car, they come back. All the nine speed, Automatic transmissions built in Kokomo, Indiana. Mm -hmm. They go from Kokomo to 
Melfi, Italy, they get installed, they come back. I should also add, very importantly, it's all the automatic transmissions for all the diesel engines, which is a very, very large number, come from Kokomo, they go to Italy, they go to the rest of the world. Diesel engines we don't get. Diesel <laughs> engines do not come here to this okay. market. So it, it truly is kind of that, that relationship of all the parts, and we're leveraging all the global benefits of, of mm -hmm. Chrysler Fiat. Given your Automotive. emphasis on, on fuel economy in this project, why did you not bring the diesel engine to the United States? I'm sure there are people out there who are going to want to ask that question. Sure, and, and, and I'm a huge fan of the, the, the diesel, in, especially in the European market with the 9-speed automatic or the manual. It's a great fit. The problem is, is the, the uh, regulatory legislation on emissions, the cost to address those, and the cost of the powertrain itself. And when you talk about it in, in this particular segment, it becomes a question of when does it, when, where's the right balance in the cost versus what the consumer wants and the benefit of it. All right, so that's really why it, it unfortunately is not in, in the NAFTA market because it's a great combination. Armand is interested in knowing, uh, he says that the Renegade feels like a baby Wrangler, but can he still get that, assuming it's a he, can I still get that open air feeling that the Wrangler gets me? Oh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes, and it's not a mistake that it feels a lot like a Wrangler because there's some great heritage there without stealing it directly but taking the theme and adjusting it. We've got a great system, a roof system that's coming into the car. We call it MySky. Basically, you take a, um, if you think of it as a, a sunroof system and make the panels removable. So we have a power system that behaves like a, a, a power sunroof but with one latch, we can take the, the panel out, the front one and the rear one, and we can store it in a bag that fits inside the back of the car. You put the windows down, it feels very much like a Wrangler experience, open air, fully connected to the outdoors. And, uh, you know, all of the, the systems in the car are still there, very easy to work, very manageable, and uh, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, so that comes in two versions. There's the so we the, can see it on this on the screen right now. Oh, the, super! Uh, yeah, that's that's the my sky. Comes in two versions uh, with power, so you can open it, and uh, without, so you just take the panels out. Mm -hmm. But the power, the power, having the flexibility, the option. So if you're in town and you just want to open the roof of the car because it's a short drive or you don't want to get out of the car, you can open the sunroof up. But if you want to take the drive up north or a little extended drive. It takes two minutes, you can get the panels out and into the back of the car, and, and away you go. So it, it's, we think it's a great system. Uh, you mentioned the lightness before, and, you, you, and, and I know a lot of people are, you know, they think Jeeps, they think off-road. And, and you you'd suggested to me when we were out in Hollister that there are some things that this thing does exceptionally well because it <coughs> is so light. Could you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, for instance, with the, we've tested the vehicle all over the world, right? Uh, uh, the, I always, Silver Dunes up north, uh, sand. The vehicle, because of its horsepower to weight ratio, and the and the and the, the, the especially the all-terrain tires on the car, it does great in sand. It's for instance, it's 600 pounds equivalent trim lighter than a Cherokee, so that means that your your force to get traction to move the car is reduced. So it makes it very nimble. The short wheelbase makes it easy to turn, cut radiuses. And uh, it it's really does well in, in a lot of those environments. So if you're in, in, a, in a soft surface, you don't sink as much, right? But you still have all the power to be able to get through the event. Uh, so you, you mentioned, you meant, we've talked a little bit about Italy. You mentioned Brazil. Um, and, and I thought I'd go back a little bit to the, sort of the global nature of this car. I mean, mm -hmm. it, um, what, 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 are your, what are your thoughts on how this car will be received? Worldwide, globally, Brazil, uh, Europe, um, uh, China, maybe eventually, and, and um, you know, ver versus here in the United States. I, I think I think the guys in the studio have done a, a great job to make it match to the brand. It's very inviting, very youthful. We've got a great color palette that's on the car. Uh, the size of the vehicle, if you drive in Europe, to park it, to turn it, to manage it, to do all the daily things, is phenomenal package. You, it's it's very easy to get into tight places, and. From a utility on the inside of the car, it, it holds a lot of stuff. So in Europe, you know, they don't have pickup trucks, but you got to get your stuff home. It works great there. And I think in, in any place where you're looking for great value for the size and the package, we're, we're, we're really fitting that bill very well. So I, I have very high expectations for it. 
What do you consider a con competitive set for this vehicle to be? What did you benchmark? Well, there's, there's really not a direct competitive set. The ones that are probably closest would be Kia Soul, the Juke, uh, Buick Encore, but there's none of those, none of those can even start to get on the trail with where we go with, with the Renegade. Uh, you guys experienced that a little bit directly, but to do all the different things we're doing, I, I think we're luckily one of the first vehicles to get to the place we are, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful we're gonna lead the way and continue to lead the way in that segment. What about buyers? Um, you, you think this will attract uh, you know, male, female buyers, uh, older, younger? Uh, any thoughts on sort of the kind of customer that, uh, that, that the Renegade is aimed at or will be really well, well received by? I, I'm, I'm not in the sales group, so I don't have all the demographics on that, but what we've noted is it's uh, pretty universally received. We get a lot of, a lot of young folks that, that get the youthful appeal of it, and we have a lot of, uh, of uh, older folks that, that get the, the practicality of it, the fun of it, you know, and that it is a smart choice. It's not like you're buying it to be just fashionable, you're buying it to be in that and you get all the things that you really need. So you're not making a trade-off. And that's the thing that puts it in the, in the sweet spot, I think. But you're also going to compete sort of with yourself, like with vehicles like the Compass. How, does it, how is that going to play out with the Renegade and the Compass and some of those, some of those vehicles that you have now in the Jeep lineup and showroom? Well, there's, there's space there. Uh, there's space there for a while, I'm sure. Uh, that's more of a question you need to, to, to ask the brand guys directly. Yeah. But uh, they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But the Compass and Patriot are going to be, we're going to see new versions of them in the not-too-distant future? Oh, I, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> All right, we or, have or an, I can't comment about it. We have an engineering question from Scott <laughs> and Cleveland. Great. An engineering question would be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did, did you engineer the platform for both the Renegade and the Fiat 500X or only the Renegade? Now, we did have the Fiat 500X uh, here in the studio uh, right. a few months ago. So That's a good question. Okay. Because when, when we set the mission, it was, it was to do both jobs, okay? So the 500X does share the architecture. It shares what we would say is the underbody. The tuning of the suspension and even some of the geometry is unique and specific and different on purpose. They go down the same assembly line in Melfi for the underbody. But after that, when you go anything outboard of the sills, it all becomes new. Right, so does it share the same body controller? Yes, right? Does it share the same steering column? Yes, steering wheel, all of those things. Everything the customer sees and touches are unique for the 500X between the Renegade. And the 500X <coughs> cannot do the same mission that the Renegade does, right? So for instance, the, 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 the all-wheel drive 500X is, is not, is not going to go do off-road with a Renegade, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got another call. Ben, please bring it in. Hi, uh, this calls for the uh, chief, uh, chief Engineer. This is Warren Webb from Paris, California, the Studebaker Ranch. I'm wondering if the uh, Renegade's going to be subject to the chicken tax, or will it have, uh, like, a final assembly and install seats or accessories at the port? No, that's uh, what's been done in the past to go around the chicken tax. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. The, the, there's no chicken tax here. It's a passenger vehicle classified. It is not an imported truck. It is a classified as a passenger vehicle, so the chicken tax does not apply. It does not have a cargo bed on the back. It doesn't have all of those. So the chicken tax normally works where somebody has what is arguably a... Uh, a truck or a commercial, a, a commercial vehicle. They, commercial they, vehicle they install truck. seats in Europe and then bring it over and then take the seats out here, right? Is mm -hmm. that right. generally how it, turn it To turn it into a truck. Right. Mm -hmm. And they send them back. I think Ford sends them back to Europe. The seats back or the vehicles back? The seats back. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, we're, we're clearly a passenger vehicle yeah. as opposed to a truck. So you don't, you don't have that problem. That's, that's not no. an issue at all. But, you know, you were talking about the 500X and, and this vehicle. So, um, we haven't had the opportunity to drive a 500X yet, so we don't, and I'm sure you have had the opportunity to drive 500X. And your we have coming soon. We, okay, but we have driven this. Yes. So is it going to be discernibly different 
the the ride and handling of the Fiat compared to the Renegade? So the the spatial feel inside the car is a little different. Yeah, it's, it's not as upright. It's more a little bit. And uh, the 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 ride and handling is a bit sportier tuning, a little sharper uh, with the inputs. You know, we've we've kind of rounded and muted some of it more what you would expect in a Jeep product. The 500X is a little more uh, on the sporty side. Tire selections are different. Uh, the handling character is is a little different. It's a little more on the front, a little more directionally pointed, but it's. By, it's on purpose. It's we set it up with that in mind from the start, mm -hmm. and you guys will have a chance to tell us how we did with the, the separation on that. But it's pretty extensive, especially with a little bit of the geometry tweaks we've done that that, that give you a different feel in the car. But you're not going to be able to do trailhawk like things with the 500X. Nor do we want to. Okay. Nor do we want to. That 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 is that is not the mission of the brand or their definition. They don't want to go there. What they do want is for sure is for people in northern climates to be able to have an, an, an all-wheel drive offering in the Fiat brand and be able to expand that, the opportunities you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now the sales are very much in the, in the, in the warm climate areas, so this will give them a much broader scope. So, so does, does this platform lend itself to producing different variants, different vehicles, whether they're Jeeps or Fiats or some of the other FCA brands? It's a it's a it's a very efficient platform. We've been very conscious about all the weight that's built into the the, the basic structure, and the cost that's in there, so the consumer gets the maximum value. Mm -hmm. um, it's a we we call it the small wide four by four architecture, and uh, we're going to have it industrialized in 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 a couple of places. You know Brazil for sure, and in, uh, mm -hmm. in Melfi. So mm -hmm. we're a big global company, so we have to see where that all takes us. But that's that's. Mm -hmm. That's the benefit of being able to mm -hmm. to get that kind of an engineering solution and then and then take it to the consumer and and they get the the return on that. So we'll have to see where that goes. So what what surprised you guys when you drove that car? <clears throat> its capability it was a very for uh, it was a very capable vehicle and it actually could do all the things that it would find in a Jeep a Cherokee or a Jeep Wrangler. It could it was still capable enough of going up a hill or over rocks and through, through streams and things like that, which mm -hmm. was very impressive. I thought, because typically vehicles in this category can't, really can't, other uh, imported vehicles can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would agree that the capability was, as advertised, the, there was an off-road course, uh, as, as you guys know, that we were able to, to ride, uh, to drive on two off-road courses, and that was pretty impressive. And the other thing that struck me was, and I think you mentioned it very briefly earlier, the interior space. Um, you know, it's we've called it a subcompact compact Jeep, uh, or, and yet it did not feel like a small vehicle inside of it. And I almost asked that question earlier: How does it? Wh how does the interior space compare to, um, you know, to, to the competitive set? The other thing was it was actually the cabin was very quiet too. I thought quiet, quiet, yeah, yeah. And then the other thing too is what for me personally is that we've been able to. Be as capable as we are, and then have such good road manners. When you're on driving on road, you're not you're not getting beat up. It's comfortable. It's quiet. It does all those things. Uh, to directly to your question, because because Brent's a fairly tall guy, uh, okay. for for the headroom, um, from a from a interior space standpoint, we're we're amongst the lead on that, uh, for sure. If we talk about headroom or cargo area. We certainly are very upright, and when you compare to the other the other folks in this segment, I think we've got them beat handily beat in that area. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the things we did that that to do that. We like the park brake, right? We do the electric park brake. It gives all that space back to you, mm -hmm. right? So the customer gets all that back. Mm -hmm. Thoughtful packaging when we put it together. Right. So. I did think the park brake worked well in that location rather than having the handbrake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a hell of a job of engineering this vehicle, and uh, we want to thank you for being on our uh, inaugural After Hours in the Afternoon show. So, All right. Art Anderson, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate your coming in and uh, bringing along a uh, Jeep Renegade for us. Thank okay. you. Thank you very appreciate much. It. Enjoy being here. Okay, and uh, so now we're going to hear from our friends at uh, Bridgestone. Okay, and we're back. So uh, as I'd uh, yeah, it's important for mentioned earlier, um, 
Jeep did very well last month with its sales, and uh, um, overall the industry did did fairly well with sales. Apparently, uh, they uh, compared to last February, sales were up uh, 5.3 percent. There was some cooling, but you know, given the fact that I don't know, this morning I went to work, it was eight degrees, so <laughs> that's that's cooling. But uh, so what I like to do, since you guys cover this industry so very well and know what's what, I want to sort of walk through. Some of some of the developments that that each of the uh, the, the major uh, automakers had. Um, Overall, trucks did very well again. They did. They 54 did. Fifty-four percent of the fifty-four percent of the fifty-five percent of the vehicles mm -hmm. sold. So it's almost like you don't have a truck; you're not doing well. So so Buick was down nine point two percent compared to last year, and seven point seven for the year. And the only thing it has is the Encore. What's going What's going on with Buick? Well, I, I think I mean it's surprising both Buick and Cadillac were were uh, were down for the month. Um, Cadillac down 16.6 percent for the month and 5.7 for the and, year. And Chevy up just a little bit, and so um, I don't know. I think it's really it, it is really interesting to look at what's going on with GM's brands right now. Um, you know, kind of a mix and inconsistent and and. And you know, so I think it, it, in February it was really just a reliance, more or less, on Chevy to to pull them through the month and be up for the month. And it's sort of your point, Joe, you, about trucks. And so you know, Chevy was up um, 3.8 for the month and 10.9 for the year. The cars, Impala, Malibu, oh. Sonic, all down. Camaro was up. Corvette was up. Spark was up. But trucks were up big time. Right, and the same pattern prevailed at Ford. If you look at Ford's numbers, you have the same same kind of pattern. You have the F-150 doing okay. It's still, one of the plants is still down, but then the other, and, the, and their Ford utility vehicles are also up. So I think, again, they were, uh, you, uh, the, the trend towards trucks is still hurting some brands and helping others. Um, I think car-dependent brands like Buick and Cadillac probably did, and Lincoln, Probably did hurt a little bit last month because of that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, GMC did really well. So I mean, it's just the the truck brand just did. Mm -hmm. did also, but I mean, so what's the, is it? Is it all gas prices for for that? Is that? I, I think gas prices are a, a very important factor, and they are among the factors. But um, you know, but if you look at what happened last year, gas prices really didn't start to drop substantially until mid to late fall. And all year, and really for several years, as you guys know, you know the crossover category has just been exploding, uh, both in terms of sales and the number of very competitive, very well-designed products that are out there. And then, and then, of course, pickup trucks for two to three years now have been gaining, 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 um, uh, as as housing has finally re recovered. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the gas prices pun intended, have added some fuel to some of these other trends that were already in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trucks have been doing well for a long, for, for as Brett said, for a while now. And I think that's, we're just seeing that continue um, again this year. Um, pickups, and utility, and also I think the manufacturers themselves have put, you see some attractive new offerings going into the utility vehicle, the, mm -hmm. the Jeep Cherokee last year, um, the new Silverado, the new F-Series. These are all kind mm -hmm. of bringing more interest into the in, onto the truck side of the business. And some of the car, cars, frankly, are getting a little bit older and longer in tooth, mm -hmm. um, that are, so they're beginning to fade a little bit. Yeah, so it's sort of interesting, you know, I mentioned Ford. Ford is down, and I mean, the only car that was up was Mustang, mm -hmm. you know, and, is, is, you know, and that really surprises me in some ways. I mean that, that uh, yeah, we all associate F one fifty with Ford, but um, you know, it still has you know Focus and Fusion and so on, and and uh, all of those were down, and uh, you know, Lincoln s still struggling along there. Um, um, all um, so, how do you feel about the the likelihood of that long term, Lincoln? <laughs> He drew a deep breath there. I'm, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I think I, yeah, I think he's right to draw a deep breath. I mean, it's uh, that's a, a tough one to figure. I guess it really, it just needs more investment. I mean, and and you don't know how much more investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple big picture thoughts on Lincoln. Lincoln has been an open question, the survival of it, really, to me, for several years. Um, the, I think the the good news is, you know, I. Mark Fields at Ford and the Ford management, they 
they know that they need to be in this for the long haul to turn Lincoln around. They know that they need to invest billions, really, in it to get back to being a, a competitive, viable premium brand. They know that, um, but knowing that and, and then translating that into a, a strategy that actually, where they knock the product out of the park and, 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 and gain buyers and change the perception of the brand, um, implementing it, uh, knowing it and implementing it are two different things and it's a, a really tall task. Mm -hmm. And in the implementation of it, um, what happens when you first, when you're spending a lot of money and all of a sudden something doesn't quite work as you planned, what happens then? That mm -hmm. becomes a real decision point mm -hmm. for, for the executives in that company about mm -hmm. whether they go forward or backwards or, mm -hmm. or drop it all together. Mm -hmm. And I think inevitably there's going to be mistakes made and then mm -hmm. what happens when we make a mistake? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then over at, our, uh, at the company formerly known as Chrysler, um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, I was, I'm, I'm very surprised to see that the sales of the Dodge Caravan and the Chrysler Town and Country were down. I mean, I mean, aren't they stalwarts? I mean, I know they've been around for a long time, but yeah. And I need to look into that more. But my my thought is, again, big picture, getting away from just the results of February. What you're looking at to some degree is, remember, the Windsor Assembly Plant, the only place they build the minivans is down for almost three months for retooling. They're retooling right now to prepare for the next generation model. Now, the odd thing about that is when it comes back up, they will still be making the old model until the end of the year or early next year, and then they will switch over to the new model. It's a, 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 an, an interesting way to do a product launch changeover, but I guess my point is, I think it's very possible they pulled back on incentives they may be a little inventory. So they may be, the issue they may be than constraining the... the inventory a little bit right mm -hmm. now, so they can get through this this downtime right. uh, and be and before they begin producing again. Mm -hmm. It's All probably right. a life cycle issue too, because mm -hmm. you're at the very end of the life cycle right. of these vehicles, and probably some dealers are sitting there saying, "Well, do I really think I can?" Mm -hmm. Maybe I'd rather steer these customers into a Jeep Grand Cherokee rather than, or a Jeep Cherokee rather than a right than a. Mm -hmm. Grand Care, uh, right. you know. Okay. All right, so here's, here's, here's one that's going to throw a monkey wrench into this whole truck thing. Toyota sales. <laughs> Up 12.1% for the month, 12.8% for the year. They outsold Ford overall for first time in quite a while. But here's the deal. The only car in the Toyota lineup that was down was the Prius. Mm -hmm. All of their sedans otherwise did well. Camry, mm -hmm. Corolla, Yaris. Mm-hmm. So what's the deal? I, I think, well, and Toyota was, I think, one of the companies that was fairly aggressive in marketing in the last couple, last 60 days. And I think they, they carried it through all the way into, uh, in, through February, and I mm -hmm. think it paid off for them. Uh, I think that was one of the things that factors that work. And um, I think, you know, you, Toyota still has a strong, basic, loyal customers out there, and they've uh, managed to exploit it mm -hmm. fairly well, but they're also their trucks also did well too. I mean, their utility vehicles also right. did very very well. But it was just surprising to me that their cars did 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 well. Mm -hmm. um, the Prius again, I think you're talking about an end of life cycle issue there. That's, right, and also the whole thing, the debate around gas and electric gas prices, vehicles, yeah. and electric vehicles mm -hmm. comes into play. And um, so Lexus also was 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 up. 22% for the month, and it's up 26.4% for the year. Which and a lot of that is on the NX, yeah. which is a... Yeah, and so it's the NX, and this is the thing that surprised me. So the NX is their compact <laughs> crossover vehicle. And um, so, so far, and this, this is just, you know, this is a brand new car, right? I mean, it's just been out for just a few, very few months. Um, so for the first two months of this year, they've sold 5,478 units of that. And so then I looked to see... The Lincoln MKC, which which I think is a very good vehicle, I like that vehicle a lot, and that's competitive with the NX. Right. And Lincoln's only sold thirty one hundred sixty. <laughs> okay, what what's what's the deal with that? I mean, because because a lot of people that you talk about the NX find its design with that spindle grill and the in the shapes to be very very polarizing. Mm -hmm. And I have not talked to one single person who has seen the MKC who thought that it was anything but a good looking car. What's the deal? Uh, you know, I, I think, again, I mean, there you've got 
the Lexus is just a very powerful brand and link. I mean, it's a brand image thing that I think overrides some some of those uh, specific model issues. As, cons as it showed up in Consumer Reports' latest uh, survey, too, Lexus was on the top, it was the top brand in the, yeah. in the survey. So Brent's right. I mean, it was, it's a very powerful brand mm -hmm. with a lot, with a lot of American consumers. Mm -hmm. It may um, not be the most powerful brand globally, but it's very powerful here in the United States. Right. Um, now to validate the truck thing, since we're going yin and yang and back and forth here, Honda. Um, Accord was down 12.2% for the month, and it's uh, down 57 for the year. Civic's down 2.5% for the month and 8.4% for the year. But the division was up 4.1% for the month and 7.7% for the year on the strength of trucks. What's the deal with the Accord and the Civic? I mean, aren't they perennially I, I best-selling vehicles? They might have got outmaneuvered a little bit by by Toyota and Nissan. Um, who probably, I would have you'd have to go back and look at the at, at the incentive money that was out there and where it was being spent. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I have, and also um, geographically, I think Honda's a little bit stronger. It, it does a little bit better in the middle of the country. And I think Toyota still does well on the coast where the weather was not as big a factor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and going back to the, qu the prior question about Toyota, I think that's a great point. And I'm thinking that, I mean, if you look at, if you look at February, the Detroit Three are strong typically in the Midwest and to some degree in the Northeast, hardest hit areas with weather and cold. And Toyota is strongest on the coasts and in the South where weather is le less of an issue for the month of February. So where there weren't feet of snow and <laughs> eight degrees right. and, uh, lot, and, and probably, that sort of a It's probably a lot easier to sell, get someone to come to your showroom in Southern California than it would to come to your showroom in, say, in Ohio or New York. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and you mentioned Nissan, and uh, um, I mean, they, they were up just marginally, but but they're just they're just really really growing at a at a tremendous pace here and uh, you know there was you know talk about you know they're they're you know passing Honda in terms of sales but mm -hmm. man if if this Titan works um, I mean won't their aspirations be even greater possibly possibly so so are you but you're I, skeptical I, I'm of a lot skeptical because I remember a couple years ago uh, maybe three years ago Carlos Carlos Ghosn threw down the gauntlet said we're going to pass uh, Honda in terms of sales and market share and they and they didn't do it and this goal of passing Honda is not a new goal it's been around for a while right and I've seen Nissan. They seem to me to be one of the more um, inconsistent companies. That one month they're up, one month they're down. Uh, 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 so I, I'm a little bit of a wait and see on on Nissan. So what do you think this up and down thing is predicated on? I, uh, my understanding. I mean, I I think Nissan more than some other manufacturers will be heavy on incentives one month and pull back a little bit of other months that, that, that rather than being, and I'm not saying that's good or bad. Uh, I just, I think that is part of their strategy. They will, they will goose the incentives and then they'll pull back a little bit. And then, but if you look at it over a annualized basis, you know, that doesn't show up so much because they're at about par. But I, I, I think they move their incentives around a little more mm -hmm. than, than some of their competitors. And so, I think um, for, the, for the last couple of years, I think they've got a boost from the product cycle. They're, they're, they were putting more fresher product into, mm -hmm. the, into the market a little bit faster than Honda and Toyota mm -hmm. were. So, so far this year, uh, Nissan North America is beating American Honda. Mm. So it's uh, according to auto data that uh, Nissan's at... Uh, uh, 222,543 units versus Honda's uh, 207,650 units. So mm. that's well, that's like, fairly significant. I mean, so, but yeah. if it and holds up for the year, months, yeah, and if it if it holds up for the year, that that could be some changes there. Uh -huh. um, but um, do do you guys think that this this you know this this slight weakening in the SAR that we saw um, is 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 that prelude to what's going to happen for the rest of the year, or do you have a sense that the rest of the year is going to be just fine? Uh, I mean, it seems like the consensus view is that this was a, w a month that was impacted by weather, especially at the end of the month. Um, it doesn't look like there's anything in the economy that would uh, explain or be a cause for consumers to be backing away. So. Um, you know, most people, most most executives and forecasters are predicting that we'll see, you know, a rebound. We'll see a really strong 
uh, March and April. Mm -hmm. If we don't, then I think we need to start asking questions about uh, what the what the year is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But then at the same token, we're beginning, we're still seeing uh, good job growth, good job creation numbers, mm -hmm. and we're also seeing some movement on the income side where, you know, you know the, the move by Walmart to raise wages is supposed to ripple through the whole, and, and that's, uh, I think those are all, those are both positive signs for, mm -hmm. for car sales going forward. You know, in, in speaking of sales, um, uh, I saw that Experian Automotive came out with a study. They do the state of automotive finance market. And boy, I'll tell you, I, maybe it's just me, but I mean, I was, I was completely flabbergasted on some of these things. Um, in, in the fourth quarter of 2014, the average monthly payment for a new vehicle hit $482, the highest level on record. And again, this is where those income and, and job creation figures have to come into play. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, the, uh, the long-term loans for new and used vehicles uh, increased from a year ago to reach 66 months for new cars and mm -hmm. 62 months for used cars. And then I, I bet you if you go down and look at the uh, leasing numbers, those are also increasing as well. Yeah, they, they're seeing uh, increase, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, so more people are even giving up on purchasing a vehicle right. and just and, and just uh, renting it. Mm -hmm. uh, those long-term loan numbers, I think, are something that that we as automotive journalists need to watch carefully. I mean, I, we keep watching them. We the consensus view is it's not a problem yet, um, but um, you know, but at some point you got to start to wonder if. If you're buying business and uh, and that doesn't come back to haunt the industry mm -hmm. a couple of years down the road, mm -hmm. or the bank, because a, yeah. whatever else you think about, it, a car is still a perishable item. Mm -hmm. At 66 months, I don't care how well built the car is, it is yeah. still not worth what you paid for coming right. out of the showroom, mm -hmm. and it's still not even, and it still needs to be reconditioned and kept up and maintained. Mm -hmm. So I, I I do like Brent says. I think you, that that's a number to, that bears watching. Right. Okay, so, so speaking of expensive vehicles, so, <laughs> so some people may be wondering, John's not here. Um, John's not here because it's the afternoon. John's not here because he is coming back from Geneva. So he's at the Geneva show this week. We obviously were not at the Geneva show this week. But one of the things that struck me the coverage of the Geneva show this week is the extraordinarily expensive and exotic vehicles that were introduced there, the Mercedes <clears throat> Maybach S600 Pullman, and the Aston Martin DBX Concept, the Bentley EXP 10-speed 6 Concept, uh, the entry-level Ferrari 488 GTB, uh, McLaren P1 GTR. I mean, okay, what's the deal? Is, oh, don't is forget this, about is, the Hyundai Tucson. But okay, is, is, the, is the deal here that these cars are there because it's Switzerland and they got a lot of banks? I mean... I think that's part of it, but um, it, it, but I think the trend in this show, or if you would look over the last three or four years, this has become kind of a, a place to show the most expensive hardware. And um, but uh, by the same token, uh, I, I guess it's because there are more customers for these vehicles too. I mean, I think you were reading off from a IHS report that suggested that. The sales of the most expensive automobiles in the world will triple in the next, be over the next decade. Mm -hmm. So there is a, there, you know, there is a market for them. So, mm -hmm. and I'd say let's just just to go back in time a month or two to the Detroit show, where we saw you know Acura NSX, Ford GT, Alfa Romeo 4C Spider, and to to some degree, I mean. <laughs> This is a what will those car payments be? <laughs> Here's a big More picture of thought that takes us out of the auto industry a little bit. But, you know, people keep talking about income disparity in this country and, and in the world. Uh, you know, the growth of the rich and the, and the growth of the, the, the decimation of the middle class. Well, if you want proof of that to some degree, look at the products that companies are creating. Mm -hmm. Some aimed at the ultra wealthy and some aimed at the lower uh, income folks. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this is evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Not the 1%, but the 10%. I mean, this yeah. is, you know, um, and um, 
Uh, and because you look at other figures and you don't, I, I guess there are, uh, you know, the, the number of automotive enthusiasts in the, uh, in the world seems to be fairly static, but there are, like, like Brent says, there's a lot more wealthier people who are looking for automobiles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what's going to happen um, to all of these wealthy cars if Apple comes out with a car? Will it affect them or do they not even pay attention to uh, things like that? The Apple, um, well, I mean, was obviously one of the hottest stories in the last couple of weeks is what is Apple up to? Um, what are they after? Um, and, I mean, that's just a really interesting thing if Apple decides to really get into uh, automotive manufacturing of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think that the most likely thing that Apple is really up to is they could become a very powerful infotainment technology provider to the auto industry and you know and based on their track record potentially revolutionize the inside of a car mm -hmm. that's what i think is most likely with with, uh, with apple um i i uh, i would be surprised if they really do get into becoming an automotive manufacturer of some kind but we'll see mm -hmm. uh, yeah and just looking at the apple as a complete outsider it doesn't seem to me that they have a a, a a manufacturing culture within the company i mean their phones their that ipad their, those are all made mm -hmm. by outsiders they're made for them by mm -hmm. contract manufacturers um would they have to reverse that if they started building cars? Um, well, we saw, you know, in, in Geneva that Magna came out, Magna Steyr came out with a with a, a full concept vehicle, and here they are a supplier. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it almost seems to me that if you're if you're Apple, you could go to a company like that and say, okay, here's the recipe. Mm -hmm. Now make this car. Oh, but mm -hmm. I mean, realistically, where the only place you would ever find that kind of capacity is in China. Um, it, uh, to make it where is it's where that came from right well exactly so. <laughs> yeah um so um there were there was big news now maybe this is just sort of inside baseball stuff for us in terms of uh toyota north america made some some executive changes and uh gave gave jim lens a still bigger job but one of the things i i, I was you know when I was, I was reading through this and i didn't realize this maybe you guys had known about this before but um there, um, it, so it's talking about uh, Simon Nagata, who is the managing officer of Toyota Motor Corporation and CEO and president of um, the um, Toyota Motor Engineering Manufacturing North America, Inc. Okay, and it says that he will be responsible for the, and this is the term I had never heard before, the One Toyota Initiative encompassing Toyota's transition to a single North American headquarters and related collaborative and integration efforts. Now, we've heard of One Ford mm -hmm. for how long now? I mean, is... Is, is this just them moving real estate and, and moving desks around, or is there a one Toyota initiative that's sort of like the one Ford initiative? I, I presume from the way they've talked that there is a one Toyota because the Toyota operation in the United States was broken up into a lot of little fiefdoms, and I think the idea now is as they move to their new quarters in Texas is to build a true integrated company that looks probably a lot like the Ford Motor Company, <laughs> um, frankly. And um, I think, and that was the whole part of Glentz's new job description. Um, that basically he runs everything. He runs everything, <clears throat> right, mm -hmm. exactly. He, he becomes uh, the, uh, the counterpart to, to Mark mm -hmm. Fields or Mary Barra. Mm -hmm. Well, if you back up a couple years, remember, uh, before we dealt with GM's recall fiasco last year, um, a couple years ago, we had Toyota's, unintended acceleration recall situation and uh, and and Toyota was s caught flat-footed and was very slow moving in how they were able to respond to that what they learned was um, you know the way they were set up at the time is silos of they had a manufacturing division that reported to Tokyo they had a sales and marketing division in the US that reported to Tokyo they had a research and development division that reported to Tokyo but they didn't uh, they didn't talk to each other very well and respond quickly in the US mm -hmm. and all a lot of what they're doing over the last couple of years has been to completely restructure the organization of the company so that they are fully integrated in the regions of the world where they operate. Mm -hmm. um, that's my understanding 
of of what of what a lot of this is all about, mm -hmm. and what the Jim Lentz's changing titles and new titles are. I mean, it's Jim Lentz is now basically overseeing everything mm -hmm. in North America, whether it's manufacturing, sales and marketing, uh, research and development, and, I don't know, I don't know. and then hopefully theoretically will allow them, if God forbid they have another crisis like that in the future, to be a lot more nimble mm -hmm. in their ability to respond. Mm -hmm. It also underscores how dependent Toyota is on the North American market. I mean, they're still the world's largest automaker, and they have to be aggressive here because, you know, you know let's face it, General Motors and Volkswagen have outflanked them in China, and uh, they're not getting anywhere near the numbers that mm -hmm. uh, GM and Volkswagen mm -hmm. have. Uh, and so they have to, I think they do believe they have to remain strong in, in North America, and if restructuring the company is what it takes, mm -hmm. that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, as we're wrapping this show up, that we ought to give a, a shout out to uh, basically a girl from the hometown, Julie Hamp, who uh, was the uh, chief communications officer at Toyota North America, and now she's going to be moved to Tokyo and be a managing officer for the company, the total company and chief communications officer. You guys both know her, mm -hmm. and um, w what's your sense of this? I think, uh, I, well, I think, uh, you know, Julie's been a very, very fine executive over the years, and I think she'll probably do a great job in, in Tokyo. And you knew her before she was an executive. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Back in her Buick City days. And, yep. and, and I actually haven't known her very long or very well, but um, about a year and a half, two years ago, I uh, met her for the first time at a, a, a large Toyota event and had a very long conversation with her. I was immediately very impressed with her and her abilities, and uh, we've worked with her at the Free Press on a couple of stories. Uh, I, I think she is very smart about how she goes about communications, and I think she will be a very good fit for that role. Okay, well, with that, uh, shout out to Julie, and we certainly hope that uh, she enjoys eating sushi or mm -hmm. whatever she's gonna do there in Tokyo. Um, <laughs> she'll do a lot, I know. Um, Brent, want to thank you. Detroit Free Press, where are you going to be found? Thank you for having me on. Joe Sesney, yep. the Oakland Press. Thanks for being here, Joe. And uh, so we want to thank all of you for tuning in or watching us online. Uh, you can see us on YouTube. Go to the YouTube channel, uh, the um, AutoLine network there. Um, so remember, we'll be back here at 3 p.m. next Thursday. John will be here. And so it'll, it'll all almost seem like normal again. So uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.